The following is a CNN special report. Massive oil rig explosion off the coast of Louisiana. Officials now. A deadly disaster. I've never been so scared my whole entire life. Families devastated. They don't have to miss him the way I do. The worst environmental catastrophe in American history. The sheen, it went on for miles. A nation watches in horror. A tide of oil hits shore. Heartbreaking new pictures coming in from the Gulf Coast. Now, five years later, we return to the Gulf as CNN investigates. I'm curious to get in the water now. The aftermath. It is a cleanup site. The Gulf is recovering strongly. Their world, the Gulf is not back. Is it really over? We have no idea how this is going to end. I'm Drew Griffin. Tonight, blowout, the Gulf oil disaster. It rose over the gleaming waters of the Gulf of Mexico more than 30 stories high and 48 miles offshore. The Deepwater Horizon, a premier vessel drilling deep into the ocean floor. Shelly Anderson's husband, Jason, helped supervise the drilling. It is the best. He loved it. It was in his blood, and he didn't want to do anything else. That's where the oil companies put their best and brightest. Keith Jones' son, Gordon, was a mud engineer on board. The deeper it goes, the more talented and able they want their crews to be. More talented to handle the rigorous and ambitious work. For more than two months, they had been drilling the Macondo well, a reservoir of millions of barrels of oil and natural gas, almost three miles below the ocean floor. The well belonged to the British oil giant, BP. BP's two partners, Transocean, which owned the rig that was drilling the well, and Halliburton, which was contracted to seal it. Home videos captured life on board. Here the crew became like family, working side by side, weeks on end. That was one of the best rigs out there. Tyrone Benton operated the rig's highly technical underwater vehicle. Did you also think it was, at the time, one of the safest? Of course, I did. April 20th, 2010, just after 9 p.m., with drilling complete, the crew of the Deepwater Horizon entered the final stages of sealing in the well. It was just a regular routine day. We um, were knocking off, saw our head supper, took a shower, just unwinding. For many, this was the end of the assignment. They would go home the next day. About to drift off to sleep. And next thing you know, boom. The loudest bang I've ever heard. Next thing you know, I hear that dreadful sound of a train whistle. If you ever hear a train whistle on a rig, that's a blowout. On an oil rig, it was the unthinkable, a blowout, sending a torrent of highly pressurized oil and gas racing uncontrollably to the surface. You're shaking and the whole rig's moving and you know things are falling down and you're hearing people screaming and yelling. It is complete pandemonium. By the time I could say, holy crap, that's when the big explosion went off. The rig is blowing. The rig, the rig is Anthony Gervasio turned towards the rig and saw this. He was on board the Horizon's supply ship, the Bankston, as the rig exploded. It actually ripped the ceiling off the wall. As Bankston crew members recorded the eruption, the crew on the Deepwater Horizon scrambled for their lives. Something that you'd never expect to see, I and mean, you're in shock. And all I could do is just kind of brace myself for the next explosion. I've never been so scared my whole entire life. Yeah, the whole time I'm watching this going, you know, this, is, this can't be, this can't, you know, 
you know, you, you, it, I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, it's just, you, you're in terror. I hear that train whistle again, and it's getting louder, and it's getting louder. And sure enough, it explodes. I was afraid that this is it. The crew rushes to the rig's two escape boats. And I turn around and the whole tower was completely engulfed in flames. Four, five, six hundred feet, just nothing but flames. And at that point, I saw one person jumping in. Each life jacket has uh, reflective tape which makes it like a spotlight in the water. A white line falling off the rig meant a crew member in a life jacket jumping for his life. Gervasio launched the Bankston small rescue boat. The water was on fire from the oil. The first person we grabbed got him on the boat and we started heading to the next person. As the deep water horizon burned, there was utter confusion on the lifeboats. They're trying to take names, trying to get account of everyone, but you really can't get account of everyone because you have people jumping overboard. That was probably the worst part of it, is being on the lifeboat. It's like you're almost waiting to die. There's people screaming. You know, put it in the water, let's go, and it's filling up with smoke, and you can feel the heat from the fire. Life rafts loaded with survivors, all heading to the deck of the Bankston, where a head count began. I sat on the back of that supply boat, just looking at it burn, and listened to the explosions all night. The surviving crew members looked around and realized they were not all there. Coming up. It was Gordon's rig, and that Gordon was unaccounted for. Hours after the blowout, the crew of the Deepwater Horizon watched explosions on the rig, reaching high into the night sky. The rig is blown. Millions and millions of barrels of highly pressurized oil and gas were an uncontrollable torrent of flame. People are in shock. Anthony Gervasio helped rescue the oil workers. They were doing roll call, they were doing muster. And there were a few guys that we just didn't hear from. 126 crew members had been on board the Deepwater Horizon when the well blew out. As the roll call continued, the crew realized not all 126 had made it off. That's when we, they knew that there was 11 missing. And I assume some of them were your friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were they're closer to me than family. And some of them were planning on getting off the rig just the very next day. Families waiting on shore were in the dark. The crew told to make no phone calls until it was confirmed 11 men were actually missing. My wife didn't have a clue on if I was alive or dead. Tyrone Benton remembers it was daylight when he finally called his wife. Remember the call? Yeah, I do. I remember it like it was yesterday. She was so happy to hear my voice. I told her, baby, I'm okay, and I will be home. I will be home. And that was it. Officials now fear the 11 workers missing since Tuesday's explosion may have been unable to escape when the blast occurred. Even as the Coast Guard searched for the missing, most knew it would have been impossible for anyone to survive. When did you find out that he's not only missing, he's gone? Oh, days, days. There was a, a certain point where I, I just knew, but I, I pretended not to. 
mostly for everybody else's sake, but we just waited for that word, that official word that the Coast Guard had stopped searching. The bodies of the missing men were never recovered. Not Shelly Anderson's husband, Jason, and not Keith Jones' son, Gordon. We didn't have anything uh, of Gordon, not a trace of anything. We have pictures. We have videos. We have, um, I have the gifts that Gordon gave me over the years that, that are precious to me. But it's a, um, it's a, it's a greater loss somehow uh, not to have anything. Five years later, Shelly Anderson has come to realize her husband predicted his fate. After the fact, you learn what he told his dad. Yes, that they uh, were doing some things that he didn't think was right. And that they were doing some things that he didn't think was right and he's gonna get somebody killed. He said those words. To his dad, not to me. It was a general sense of a rush, of pressure, of not taking the time to be careful. Richard Lazarus wrote the official Presidential Commission report on the disaster. A crew member's email uncovered by that commission said the operation was flying by the seat of our pants. There's no question it's a culture of let's get this done as quickly as possible. Because the quicker you get it done, the more quickly you get home, and you spend less money on the development stage of the well. The project was behind schedule, over budget, and hemorrhaging a million dollars a day. They were doing a lot of shortcuts, and I wasn't aware of those shortcuts until now. And it made me so angry to know that they didn't think of our lives as that important. You know, it hurts. But shortcuts were only part of the problem. What we saw really was more of a systemic failure that was expressed by individual incorrect decisions. But there were a whole series of them. Among the findings, the cement seal at the bottom of the well had failed. The final pressure test to determine the well's stability was misinterpreted. The rig crew missed a warning kick, the first sign of pressure coming from the well. The final line of defense against disaster, the blowout preventer, didn't work. Who is ultimately responsible for this accident? I think BP is the one who had the ultimate responsibility. It was their well. They were in charge of the drilling. They are in charge of the process. So they're ultimately responsible for it, and they're the ones who made the mistakes. They're not the only ones. Halliburton, we think, had a major responsibility here as well. And our conclusion was their cement failed. And we found several mistakes that Transocean had made in terms of their training of their personnel. In April of 2010, there was much more to deal with than assigning blame. With the explosion of the well, another crisis was brewing. Coming up... The sheen. The first thing you saw was the sheen. Deep underwater, an unprecedented environmental disaster was taking shape. A hurricane of pollution was building in the Gulf. The inferno that was once the deep water horizon only stopped burning when it sank to the ocean floor. The fire was out, but the disaster was just beginning. Oil spreading for miles across the Gulf. In Louisiana, Plaquemines Parish President Billy Nungusser feared what was coming. When it did surface, and it was out there offshore, uh, everyone along this coast was worried that it was coming ashore. Then came the image that horrified Americans. Live, underwater pictures of the well itself, gushing oil. CNN had that shot in the corner of the television all the time. It was horrific. Janet Napolitano was head of Homeland Security. 
BP uh, alerted us to additional oil leaking from their deep underwater well. But the federal government could do almost nothing to stop the relentless flow. There's a very confusing statute that came into play, and it said that BP was the responsible party, therefore they were our partner. In other words, the government had to rely on the polluter, BP, to fix it. It was a, a foreign company that came here and seemed to be making all the decisions, and that's unfortunate. Juliet Kayyem was in charge of coordinating the government's response. And there was no other way. No other way. I mean, so you get rid of BP. Who do we have to close the darn well? But BP didn't have a quick solution. They may have had a plan, but they certainly had never practiced it, executed it, equipped for it, for a rig of this size, drilling at this depth, experiencing a catastrophic failure. How catastrophic? When the event first started, our best estimate at the time was 1,000 barrels a day. But as we began to gather more data, we actually revised that number to 5,000 barrels a day. The initial estimate said the Macondo well was releasing 5,000 barrels of oil a day into the Gulf. But internally, BP leadership had been warned the leak could be as great as 70,000 barrels a day. If there was anything that we could redo in those early days, it would be you know, don't trust the numbers. As this image ran day after day on CNN. I'm Tony Haywood. BP has taken full responsibility for cleaning up the spill in the Gulf. The oil company launched a PR campaign in the midst of the uncontrollable disaster. Then BP's CEO, Tony Hayward, made a very poor choice of words. There's no one who wants this thing over more than I do. You know, I'd like my life back. I lost my son on the Deepwater Horizon. That's the life he ought to want back. But he, but he didn't. He wanted his life back. There was the BP of wanting to get their life back. There was the BP of yacht clubs and, and sailing lessons that you looked at and just thought, they're not getting it. They're not getting it. Out in the Gulf, a battle to clean up the oil waged on with little success. The slick was intentionally set on fire. Workers on boats tried to vacuum and scoop it up. Finally, the U.S. government made a controversial decision. It would allow BP to use a chemical dispersant sprayed in huge quantities to break the oil up. The air was toxic. Um, the water was not this crystal, magnificent blue. Oceanographer Mandy Joy and her team have worked for 20 years in the Gulf. She says no one could grasp just how much oil was out there. People were so sick they had to go into their bunk. And then there were the birds and the sea turtles that you saw covered in oil. You could see the extent of how much oil was out there. I think that was the moment for me when I realized that this was an environmental disaster unlike anything I had ever seen. Ocean conservationist Philippe Cousteau saw what was happening on the surface. As the oil flowed, he took a dive to find out what was happening underwater. I don't want to have to be here. And if I was here, I'd want to be doing like a, you know, free diving off one of these rigs. We were in full vulcanized dry suits. We had hard helmets on because not only the oil is toxic, the, the, the dispersant is a neurotoxin as well. The oil isn't confined to the surface. It is distributing throughout the water column. The whole purpose was to help the world recognize that there is not just uh, the oil at the surface, but there's a lot more that's going on beneath the surface. And seeing that oily mess just descending from the surface down as far as I could see, jellyfish, dead jellyfish covered in oil, algae, fish, everywhere you looked, there was just devastation. Once that oil hit shore, we lost the narrative. When it hit, marshes were blackened, birds and fish were dying. The government couldn't contain the disaster, 
or control the message. It's hard to look at these heartbreaking new pictures uh, coming in from the Gulf Coast. We lost the narrative with CNN. I mean, it was, you know, it was an oiled pelican every single day. We knew that was coming. We just hadn't prepared everyone for it. For more than two months, BP engineers had worked day and night trying and failing to find a way to stop the oil. Underwater operations involving huge caps and huge risks delicately put in motion. There was a real risk that it would cause an explosion within the reservoir and lead to this uncontrolled spill. They're watching with just holding their breath. Finally, on the 87th day of the spill, the oil stopped, the cap held. A successful seal. BP says it has permanently plugged the well in the Gulf. The total spill, a staggering total, more than four million barrels of oil. More than a thousand miles of shoreline was covered in it. Tourists fled, the offshore oil industry was shut down, fishing in the Gulf was halted. The economy of the Gulf was crumbling. That was something that just kind of drove a nail in the coffin of a lot of families that their son might have been a fisherman, their husband might have worked offshore. All anyone could do was look offshore and ask, would the Gulf ever recover? From high above, five years after what has been called the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history, the water of the Gulf looks picture perfect. You got dolphins there. That's dolphins. It sure is. But is it? In the weeks after the blowout, ocean conservationist Philippe Cousteau saw the Gulf at its worst. My last memory of diving in the Gulf was surrounded by this oily red mess. We had to wear full vulcanized dry suits, big hard helmets, basically hazmat diamond. Now he's back for another look. Around this artificial reef, under an oil rig, the Gulf is teeming with life. clear and, and beautiful and it, and it just makes what I saw five years ago all the more astonishing. But Cousteau knows looks can be deceiving. It's easy to be fooled by an image. One of the challenges with ocean conservation is the old adage out of sight out of mind. And it's important to remember that that a lot of that oil now is not floating on the surface is not uh, sticking to the marshes, but it is existing down at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. We recently published a paper documenting that some of that oil is on the seafloor. Oceanographer Mandy Joy is using robots to track the remaining oil. We collect a lot of sediment and we bring it back uh, to the lab for experiments. The only way we can do it is to go out, collect sediment cores, and then you can say, OK, we found oil here, here, and here. And then we extrapolate, and we came up with about 10 million gallons. And the area was as big as the state of Rhode Island, basically. It's bigger than that. Research from Joy and others shows the oil is scattered in patches across more than 1,200 square miles of seabed. That stuff's not going to stay put. It's going to move around. So is it better for it to be on the bottom? than in the water column. Frankly, there's so much that we don't know. Jeff Morrell is BP's Senior Vice President of Communications. You agree some of the oil is still on the ocean floor? No. 1,200 square miles, you don't believe no. that? 
BP's own studies have come to very different conclusions. The data that has been collected points to there being no missing oil, no layer of oil that spreads out across the Gulf floor, but that any residual oil that still remains is around the wellhead in a tight radius, about two kilometers, and in small patches of tar mats that are buried along the Gulf states that are actually at this point few and far between. But Cousteau believes the oil is spread throughout the ecosystem. It is still, uh, in many cases, uh, in the sand, uh, along the shoreline, along the, the marshes, and also existing on a, on a microscopic scale. We may not be able to see that with the naked eye, but it doesn't mean that it's not having a tremendous impact on, on the wildlife that exists in and around the Gulf of Mexico. Assessing the impact of the spill is tricky, even here. You were saying you're stunned. That Five years ago when we were here, it was just a lush, green, grasses, mangroves, very important bird nesting islands. And it was a true island, not this spit of land. Back then, Cat Island was covered with nesting birds. Then suddenly, it was covered with oil. All that's left of these roots, with these little tree stubs of mangroves. And I mean, imagine this place just covered. David Muth is with the National Wildlife Federation's coastal campaign. The mangroves began to show signs of stress. Fewer and fewer birds were able to nest. Until now, we're to the point that there's no mangroves living, and there's no nesting going on here. Was the oil to blame? or the years of erosion that preceded the spill, or both. It is hard to be sure. Proving the oil spill caused permanent damage to the environment and wildlife has been tricky. Studies have found coral reefs showing signs of damage and decay. Birds, from pelicans to laughing gulls to seaside sparrows, have experienced declines. And dolphins are dying at accelerated rates. We spotted this mother trying to revive her dead calf. We don't know what this baby dolphin died of. There is no direct proof so far that BP's huge oil spill will have a permanent negative effect on any species. The Gulf is clearly much more naturally resilient than we ever appreciated. BP's conclusion, the Gulf is rebounding. We are not in any way uh, trying to suggest that there was not an impact. There clearly was. Birds, fish, turtles, subsea vegetation and sediment species all were impacted. There's no question about that. But they have also, according to the data, bounced back and are recovering strongly. And there is no data that suggests there are any long-term population level impacts to any species. The Natural Resource Damage Assessment trustees, government agencies studying the effects of this spill, called BP's report inappropriate as well as premature. Though the trustees' research is not complete, they said we know that the environmental effects of this spill are likely to last for generations. The trustees say we don't know enough yet to draw the same conclusion that BP is drawing. And NOAA, the government official that we talked to, said you know, BP is cherry picking its data. We're not cherry picking the data. If you look at the report we put out at the five year mark, it shows things both positive and negative about the environment. So this is not cherry picking by any means. This is the most comprehensive view of the Gulf. Is the Gulf nearing recovery? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we are in the process of a long-term study of the effects of the BP oil. Um, you can't do population level studies overnight. It takes time to look and see what's happening. And when you're talking about showing the restorative values in the BP campaign, they're certainly not showing you this. They're not showing you Cat Island. No, they're not showing you this. Coming up, five years later, the oil remains. Stay away from the hazardous material at the moment because it is a clean up site.
Barataria Bay, Louisiana, the marshes and the shores of these small islands were once covered in oil. Today, from our boat, we spot two dozen workers wearing face masks, shoveling, working on a stretch of beach. We pull up to take a look. How you doing? Doing good. Drew Griffin with CNN. Nice to meet you, sir. This is Philippe Cousteau. What's going on? We have to have you stay away from the hazardous material at the moment because it is a clean-up site. The hazardous material turned out to be BP's oil, a 90-foot-long, 30,000-pound tar man. We had a small tar ball tested, and it matched the oil from the spill. The fact is, five years later, there is still oil. Oil in big enough clumps that it needs to be dug up by a crew like this, digging down 30 inches, trying to take it and remove it. The pockets of tar mats that still exist are in areas that are known to us, but which were deemed by the federal government to be better to leave alone there and let them be naturally exposed to er through erosion and then for us to clean them. So as they appear, we are finding them and removing them, but none of them poses a threat to human or aquatic life. And is this going to go on for years and years? However long it goes on, the company is committed to cleaning up that which is exposed and that which is Macondo oil. At the, at the end of the day, how much do you anticipate this spill is going to cost BP? The company has provisioned $43 billion for all the liabilities associated with the spill. We have spent thus far just in honoring our obligation to help restore the Gulf environment and economy, $28 billion. Half of that $28 billion, according to BP, has been paid to settle hundreds of thousands of claims to businesses and individuals across the Gulf who suffered a financial loss as a result of the spill. Third generation oysterman Mitch Jurisic runs one of the largest oyster operations in Louisiana. He's already settled for millions and is using the money, he says, to rebuild his oyster beds. Sure, we're getting money from them and we're investing it. But we're investing it in something we don't know if we're going to get back. And the spawn is there. And the oyster larvae, for some reason, is not living. That's the problem. Though fishing in the Gulf has improved overall, Jurisic fears an uncertain future. We've been on a steady decline since the spill, and we're looking at about a 40% decrease from the previous year. What happens 10 years from now? What happens 15, 20 years from now? Across the Mississippi on the east side of Louisiana's famed oyster grounds, it's a much bleaker story. This is Point Alahash. Oystermen here aren't the biggest in many cases. They're the smallest. We work day for day. I didn't own a boat. I mean, somebody gave me a skiff to go out there and survive, make, make a living. And five years later, you still got no oysters. No oysters, and we can't even repair our boats. We can't afford to do that. The oysters in the public grounds of Plaquemines Parish are not back. In a controversial move, the state of Louisiana tried to keep oil out by diverting fresh water in. The fresh water is being blamed for killing the oysters. For five years here, there hasn't been a harvest or a paycheck. I don't get nothing. <laughs> I'm out in the cold. Byron Enkelade is suing BP. Other fishermen here say they're still waiting on settlement claims. We're being left behind. We've been left behind. Point La Hash without an oyster for five years now. And no relief in sight. None whatsoever. So we're five years out. Most people in the country see those commercials. Yeah. Gulf is back. Yeah. Food is good. Yeah. The beaches are clean. Yeah. What's, your, what's your message? <laughs> My message say come to Point La Hash and see a community just dying away. Former Plaquemines Parish President Billy Nungusser, who's now running for Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana, says this is the unseen damage of the BP oil spill. For many, a way of life that may be ending. Louisiana seafood is the best in the world. 
and so the livelihood of a lot of people depend on it, not just the fishermen. People that work in the restaurants, people that distribute. It's a whole culture here and it's a whole way of life that for the last five years as it's come back, and it has some, what is going to be the long-term effects and will, will, will there be a drop-off at some point that uh, won't be sustainable? And that's, that's the unknown question. And you're saying not only is there a lingering fear, but there's a lingering fear that's preventing reinvestment or investment in the future. Well, I think some, you know, some of the fishermen have sold their boats. Some of them have, have opted to try to do other things. And that's, that's sad because, you know, a lot of these people, this is in their blood. It's been in, in their family for generations. Out in the Gulf, one industry is coming back. Still ahead, the hunt for oil is going deeper and farther offshore. But is it any safer? Could this happen again? Yes, the industry is the same industry. Oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico is back. So is BP. Drilling deeper and even farther into the Gulf, but is it any safer? We have really beefed up our training. We have far greater oversight of our operations now, including a 24-7 high-tech monitoring facility in Houston. We've introduced new technology that clearly makes drilling safer, but also, if God forbid there were ever a problem in the future, will prevent it from ever manifesting itself into a spill of the size and duration and proportions that the, the Deepwater Horizon was. BP's Jeff Morrell insists the company has learned its lesson. We determined what were the causes of the accident, what our role in it was, but more broadly, we looked at what were things that we all could do to become safer as an industry when it came to offshore drilling. The industry has made voluntary improvements like deploying capping stacks around the world that can instantly stop the flow of oil. And there is a new federal agency and new regulations to oversee offshore drilling, but Congress has yet to give that agency sufficient power. Congress has done? Congress has done absolutely nothing. Zero. And this is just truly stunning uh, to me. Richard Lazarus wrote the official government report on the oil spill, and his staff made recommendations to improve deep water drilling safety. Only some of the recommendations have been acted on. Here we had extraordinary, it's a nation's biggest environmental catastrophe. And five years later, Congress has passed not one word of legislation to make any effort to go after and reduce the risks. The industry is the same industry. Uh, it wants its oil. Juliet Kayyem, who helped guide the White House response during the spill, now teaches emergency response at Harvard. There's been no congressional changes. So this could happen again? It could happen again, right. I mean, absolutely. My prayer is that it won't happen again, but we can't know that. Keith Jones has spent part of the last five years fighting to change legislation in memory of his son, Gordon. He has been unsuccessful. As long as that oil was gushing, congressmen and senators couldn't see me fast enough. The day they cut off that oil, you could feel the climate change. It was palpable. Crisis over in their minds. Right. My life is in two parts, the part before Gordon was killed and the part after Gordon was killed. And that part of my life is five years old now, and it'll always be different. We feel terrible about what happened. This was an awful tragedy, and we feel sorry for what they've gone through. I don't think there's anything I or anyone else at BP could say that would in any way ease their pain. The best that we could probably do for them is what we are doing now, which is to make sure that each and every day, all 80,000 of us get up with a singular focus, and that is to make sure that an accident like this or any other never happens again. 
They didn't know Jason. They don't have to love him the way I do. They don't have to miss him the way I do. They don't have to wish that he was here. Jason's memory is here. Shelly Anderson, who lost her husband in the blast, settled a lawsuit that will keep her and her two children financially secure. I was hospitalized. I was stressed. I had high blood pressure to the point where I couldn't take care of my children. And I'm all they have left, so yes, we settled it. I just couldn't go on anymore. Emotionally, her future is day by day. How'd you do? She holds no bitterness for BP or the oil industry. Do you have homework? I have a different life. Not the one I'd planned for. Okay, so one fish was up there. I'm here, I have two wonderful children and if we are gonna do the best we can every single day. It is much the same for the Gulf itself. Is it truly back? No. Is it truly destroyed? No. It is a different life, struggling, surviving, and it may never be the same.